Perfect. Uh, well, welcome everyone to the second of our virtual information sessions. Um, with you tonight is, is myself. My name is Andrew Bomberger. I'm the Transportation Planning Coordinator uh, at Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. Uh, joining me in the office today is, or this evening is Lauren Weaver, who's a, another transportation planner in our office. And on the phone is Kyle Snyder, yet another transportation planner in our office. Um, so like I said, the, the, these are virtual information sessions that we're having kind of in, in lieu of our, of our quote unquote normal in-person uh, public outreach efforts uh, as part of the public comment period for the 2045 regional transportation plan. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll get started. Uh, so we are Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. We are the, the planning staff for the Harrisburg Area Transporta Transportation Study. We're also the county planning staff for Dolphin and Perry counties. And we also have a regional program. Um, so the, the, the transportation planning activities uh, fall under kind of the, the HATS umbrella of our organization. HATS is the federally, man, the federally designated organization that oversees the planning and programming of federal transportation funds across Dolphin, Cumberland, and Perry counties. Uh, our HATS board consists of representatives from each county, as well as the city of Harrisburg and Capital, Trans, Capital Area Transit. Uh, we have a coordinating committee that, that's comprised essentially, or mainly of, of elected officials, um, or includes elected officials, I guess I should say. And then we have a technical committee that that's uh, appointed by those counties and uh, the other representatives uh, that that kind of meets first and typically considers more of the technical aspects and the and, and some of the more detailed analyses that then provides a recommendation to that coordinating committee. Uh, we work with municipalities and other stakeholders to identify the transportation needs and priorities across the region. And those are then applied to the development of transportation improvements, uh, mainly through the transportation improvement program or what we call the TIP. So tonight we're here to, to kind of cover and give a give an overview of the of the update the for the regional transportation plan. So our regional transportation plan is the long range framework for the expenditure of federal transportation funds over a 25 year period. It's fiscally constrained. It's objectively evaluated. Uh, and a few years ago, we transitioned to more of an online document that emphasizes the kind of the ongoing nature of all of our transportation activities and got away from the static, uh, you know, four inch thick document with hundreds of pages, uh, much more of a kind of a living working document that that we use throughout our activities and kind of guides our work. Um, so this update was initiated to ensure we had the most comprehensive list of transportation needs uh, as determined by our outreach with the public, stakeholders and our municipalities and to make sure we're using the most current available data in our evaluations and decisions. Um, and while, while we anticipate adoption of the plan coming here in, in September, uh, we consider this, like I said, an ongoing process more than a static document. And the success and effectiveness of that depends highly on the participation from the public, stakeholders, and municipalities. <laughs> um, so one of the things we developed as kind of an outreach tool, uh, and Kyle, are you seeing the story map now? Yes, I am. Okay, so one, one of the one of the things we we developed uh, to kind of guide people through that aren't that aren't real familiar with 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 regional transportation plan either the current or just in general is this story map 
Um, I'm going to use it as kind of a guide for, for this overview as well. Um, it, it's embedded with links and, and some information as well as mapping and, and just a, a kind of a quick, easy access to the resources uh, that are contained in the plan. Um, so kind of went over went over the about the RTT section already. So the goals and objectives, of course, are, are kind of essential to any kind of planning effort. Uh, they're presented here to provide the context and overarching themes that guide both the development of this RTP and our plan and our transportation planning in general. Uh, if they really focus on providing opportunities choices for all users while balancing priorities related to asset management, which we typically refer to as kind of the term we use for road and bridge condition, uh, safety, and the efficiency of the system. And th those are things that come kind of directly out of our federally mandated performance measures. Uh, the most notable update, or yeah, the most notable kind of portion of, the, of this update is our safety section. Um, as well as some other updates to the project pipeline, but there's there's a there's a fair amount new in the safety section that was developed with regard to the safety performance measure that got that you know is a very important kind of typically the the most scrutinized part of our planning efforts uh, and the 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 ultimate goal uh, of our of our safety planning uh, is a transportation network that with no crashes that result in fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, we actually adopted a, a motion or a kind of a mission statement that, that makes that a little clearer uh, back in early 2020. Uh, and, and as we'll discuss here in a, in a few minutes, that's kind of the overarching, overarching mission and, and guiding, guiding force behind our safety plan. Oh. Um, so, like, like I said, uh, the the main the major new portions of the plan uh, include the safety um, safety updates, as well as some things in the in the non motorized transportation section, and then our project pipeline, which is kind of our implementation uh, our our implementation strategy and, and mechanism uh, to to start to uh, um put the put put the priorities into action as they come through the needs um so before we get to some of our highlighted sections here i did want to take a minute um to go over our kind of the the, the form and format of our of our review page for the 2045 plan um all of the updated chapters are accessible through this page. Uh, you can get to that this page through our website, tcrpc-pa.org, under the transportation tab, down to regional transportation plan, and it's this first uh, this kind of first section with multiple links in there. They pretty much all take you. There's a few there, but the this this link here will take you to this kind of landing page. It's kind of our headquarters for all of the resources and information for the 2045 RTP. So within this page, there's links for, links for each chapter in the updated plan. Uh, there's a, a story map that I, that's what I was going through. That's available here. There's a printable PDF copy of the plan that's available here. Uh, Towards the bottom of the page, there's some additional kind of supplemental documents, including the air quality conformity analysis and resolution, as well as our public participation plan, uh, some of our outreach materials. And then back up at the top, uh, you can find the recording for the previous, uh, previous public information session that was held on July 14th. Uh, currently, the uh, place to register for this public information session is available here and then that will be replaced uh, with the recording obviously at the completion of this um, 
So then within each chapter, I here's the non-motorized. When you click on the on any of these links. This is what we'll take you to as long as you're seeing this draft 2045 regional transportation plan the header across the top, you know that you're, you know, in the draft. The draft edition that's that's available for review and comment and, and not the current edition that's that's in effect that this is then replacing. Um, so within each of these pages there's. You know there's obviously the text of. of of each chapter, but then there's also, if you click on the thumbnails of, of the mapping, that's how you get into our uh, interactive mapping application uh, that has corresponding, at least one, sometimes two, uh, corresponding maps for each section, each chapter. Uh, and then additionally, there are, um, Additionally, there are tabs that allow you to explore all layers, which essentially lets you build your own map and kind of create your own experience with layering as many different data uh, sources and, 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 and objects uh, as you want. So if you want to, you know, if you want to look at plain sect areas, uh, and how they, you know, how they correspond some of our minority percentage groups, um, you know, any basically any data we have in the plan is available through these explore all layers tab. So, just a, a, an additional tool that we've actually found pretty useful. So, uh, back to the story map. So here I'm I'm gonna, and I guess we are gonna talk about briefly each of each of these kind of highlighted chapters. Uh, some of them have significant updates, some of them don't, but are just kind of important chapters in the plan nonetheless. Um, so the first one we want to talk about is our safety chapter. Safety is our high is, is really our highest priority at Hats and in the RTP. Uh, the mapping that you're seeing here reflects priority corridors developed by utilizing the PennDOT Highway Safety Manual method. Uh, in essence, that compares predicted to observe crash rates and identifies clusters that have high excess values. So all of these, all of these segments you see are where um, we are seeing uh, we are we are seeing crashes, crash rates that are higher uh, than we kind of expect them to be. And the darker purple are actually areas that are um that are high priority which were just determined by the top 10 uh locations in each county uh and I, as i mentioned earlier hats adopted a, a safety mission statement beginning of 2020 that seeks to ultimately um ultimately eliminate crashes resulting in fatalities and serious injuries uh that, 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 that was kind of developed as we looked at our safety performance measures and wanted to set an ultimate goal that kind of guided us in addition to uh, those federally mandated performance measures. Uh, we do have some, as I said earlier, we have some new and uh, extremely useful, and I, I use this term in, in the context of transportation planning, but exciting uh, resources that that we've developed over the past year or so uh, that I that I'd like Kyle Snyder, who's kind of our safety guy in the office to, to discuss here. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, can you scroll down a little bit? Perfect. So um, what you're seeing on the screen now is actually uh, an interactive safety web application that we've made uh, for the tri county region. So what this does is takes a five year um, aggregate of publicly accessible crash data from PennDOT and allows you to zoom in and search um, throughout the region. So uh, if you could zoom in a little bit on the map. 
Can we do that? Yeah. So um, on the left hand side, it gives you kind of snapshots of data. So within the current extent of the web application, it'll give you the number of fatalities, the number of suspected serious injuries, the total number of crashes, uh, the day of week that the crashes occurred on, the crash year, um, the bottom center gives you the crash type. You can click on hour of day um, and then also crashes by month. And then there's also filters available in the bottom right hand corner. So what this allows you to do is you can see trends of when um, you know, alcohol and impaired driving related crashes are occurring and when they're occurring um, and also where they're occurring throughout the region. So we did this to kind of allow, um, you know, all stakeholders throughout the region the opportunity to, to look and see through the data that's already made available, but this makes it just a little bit more accessible to everyone. Um, so not only are we doing this application, but we're currently working on kind of um, a supplemental analysis to what the work that PennDOT does. So uh, we're kind of branding it the Highway Safety Manual Light Analysis version, but it takes uh, a similar approach in that it analyzes um, each roadway segment for different factors of geometry attributes, such as the number of lanes, the speed limit, et cetera. And it basically assigns this expected value of crashes. So um, what we're doing is we want to have the opportunity to do a similar type of analysis in-house on a more frequent basis because um, the work that PennDOT does is extremely in-depth and it's an extremely um, time and labor intensive process to do that analysis. So we want something that would give us the opportunity to do it more frequently so that we can get a more up-to-date picture of kind of safety throughout our region. So. Um, that's what we're working on now. We're hoping to have that tool available, um, you know, later this fall um, that we can start using it on a pretty frequent basis as well. So from a safety perspective, that's what we're working on. We also are doing um, TIM teams, so traffic incident management, which kind of ties into both congestion and safety. So I thought I'll just bring it up here. But um, we support a few different traffic incident management teams, which is basically just a group of first responders, uh, towing officials, um, transportation officials from you know, PennDOT and also the municipal side, and um, just kind of talking about issues within the region, sharing best practices, um, kind of sharing things that are going on or recent, recent trends within the region. So um, really to improve response to traffic incidents in order to uh, clear the scene quickly and safely to allow for the resumption of normal traffic flow. So we support a team that's in the Beltway area of Harrisburg, which also includes uh, representatives from Cumberland County as well uh, as Dauphin County. And then we support a Greater Lebanon and Hershey TIM team, which is, um, you know, kind of the Hershey and Greater Lebanon County uh, team as well. So Thanks, Kyle. Um, so we're gonna move on to asset management. Um, as I said before, asset management is kind of the, the, the general term we use for road and bridge conditions. So uh, Hat, Hats has a lot of responsibility when it comes, we, we have a lot of roads kind of under our purview. Uh, Steve mentioned on the last one, he like he he likes to quote this. If, if you laid our all of our roads end to end, you could go from Harrisburg to Salt Lake City. So we we have a lot of, of road mileage that we are kind of responsible for analyzing and planning and programming. Um, and, and you know, we take that we take that responsibility pretty seriously. Um, and asset and kind of managing those assets is a high priority in, in this 2045. Uh, RTP, uh, maintaining our, our current system and assets, ensuring that we use our funds to deliver the best uh, condition roads and bridges possible. The data that we show on this map and in the, and in the uh, RTP itself uh, is the most current available condition data from PennDOT. Um, and, and we also had to 
had to reflect a, a fairly significant change in, in PennDOT's approach to asset management and that uh, up, up until 2019, and that's when they uh, adopted their the, the state transportation asset management plan, the, the TAMP, uh, that kind of switched us from a worst first approach. So, you know, the, the worst condition bridges, the worst condition roads got, got the money and, and, and were kind of the focus of investment. We kind of switched approach to a lowest life cycle cost that, that uses a little bit more in-depth analysis to identify uh, when, when kind of the best time to make targeted investments that could extend the life of an asset. Uh, um, and kind of improve the system holistically, rather than just trying to address the the worst rated ones um, first. So the the language in, in the asset management chapter changed in that regards. Uh, one of the other big kind of things we we found in the asset management uh, chapter is related to locally owned federally aid eligible roads and bridges. Uh, it was brought up by a number of municipalities in our outreach efforts that, uh, you know, currently municipalities are responsible for collecting condition data for their roads. And for a lot of them, this represents a significant hurdle. So we are actually already working on developing a process that would help close that gap, uh, help municipalities, uh, do analyses on their own roads and 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 uh, do things like like evaluate the, the the roughness index, the IRI of their roads, and and other kind of data necessary to get it into PennDOT system so that everything can kind of be considered on the same level uh, and with the same most up to date data uh, possible. So. Moving on to congestion, uh, MPOs do what, what's called a, conge a congestion management plan. It's traditionally a very, very technical, data-heavy kind of static document that's done about every five years or so. Uh, one of the down kind of downsides to that approach is that it really only represents a snapshot in time. Uh, that's what this mapping here shows. It's showing the... Uh, High, the, the, the intersections, which are the points and the corners, which are the lines, was kind of the highest amount of delay. Uh, you know, the, it, was a, it was a fairly sophisticated analysis that went in to determining these, but it takes a lot of work and, it, and it's, not, it's not very responsive. And, and it, it kind of, it, it's, a, it's a big lift that, that we aren't able to, to be dynamic with. So, um, we've been working on, on developing a, a, a more real-time approach uh, that allows us to better evaluate the congestion uh, and make decisions, not just regarding infrastructure improvements like building roads and bridges and, and kind of building things, but also uh, where we can make operational improvements, doing things like retiming signals or, or coordinating signals and, and kind of linking them so we have you know, whole quarters that the, that the signals are all kind of in sync and, and, and maximizing the efficiency of that corridor. So uh, uh, Kyle, you're also kind of our congestion guy. Do you have anything to add to that? Sure, so um, as Andrew mentioned, our, our current effort for the congestion management aspect is focusing on going from uh, a static plan update to more of a, a dynamic process where we can monitor congestion um, in real time and see the impacts of the improvements um, in real time as well. Um, additionally, we are also now a Ways for Cities uh, connected partner. So what that means is we um, are receiving real time data from the travel application ways and what that does it gives gives us real time crowdsourced data for congestion accidents road hazards um, so in in real time we can see how roadways are operating uh, without the expense of putting out roadway sensors throughout the entire region so um, 
that's what we've been working on recently and we hope to kind of start collecting that data and using it to um, you know make better decisions and, and find out how the roadways are operating in real time um, yeah I think that's that's pretty much it all right th thanks Kyle uh, so let's move on to uh, non-motorized transportation uh, th this is an often overlooked kind of aspect in transportation planning and programming, uh, but it is an absolutely essential part of any comprehensive transportation network. Uh, the, the 2045 chapter really builds on what we did in the 2040 chapter. Um, on screen here is a map that shows both bike ped demand, which is kind of the heat mapping. The darker colors indicate kind of more of our estimated demand. That's based primarily on, on land uses and concentrations of those land uses. So kind of things that people would want to walk and or bike to. Um, so the line work, the different colors of line work you see here is, is, a, is a new analysis that we did for this plan. It's called a bicycle level of stress. Uh, it's an analysis that, that, that kind of seeks to estimate how comfortable uh, any given road is for a cyclist based on the number of lanes, speed limit, and shoulder width. Um, we also have, I'm going to switch over to the actual, this is the actual uh, um, chapter in the plan. So we also have our regional backbone. That's kind of the end product of the the, the kind of implementation effort of, of the bike ped plan or the non-motorized chapter. Uh, the regional backbone combines existing and planned facilities. So you can kind of see in the, in the uh, legend here, the existing and planned facilities. It, it also is a, a kind of compilation of, of regional and local planning documents. So any municipal or, or multi-municipal bike ped plans or trail plans. Um, and then for areas where neither of those exist, we have a bike ped, a HATS bike ped task force, uh, as well as some municipal outreach we've, we've done kind of toward this end that identified kind of the other routes, the, the other kind of places that, that don't have dedicated planning studies. So you, any of these dashed conceptual lines that's where that, that that's based primarily on on bicycle and pedestrian advocate input, as well as like I said, some municipal input. So uh, the backbone do, does not kind of seek to prescribe solutions. Uh, what we're what we want to do is identify the most important routes across the region, uh, so that kind of the more the, a lot of those locally focused uh, plans can then use the, the routes that we've identified to make the more local connections to individual points of interest or, or land uses or, or you know, the individual communities um, that, that they're seeking to make more walkable and bikeable. Um, so go back to the story map. So I also wanna talk about environmental justice, um, which in transportation planning, that refers to analyses that examine uh, the impacts of, of the transportation system on low, low income and minority populations. Uh, HATS staff, along with them, all, all of the MPOs in, in PennDOT District 8, as well as a bunch from across the state have it, this has been kind of a years long, a multiple years long effort, uh, re-examining and trying to optimize our EJ approach, analysis, strategies. Um, and a few years ago, we we all participated in what was called a unified methodology. That was developed in cooperation with Rutgers University. Out of that, we got what we refer to as our core elements. So those core elements are kind of the minimum requirements and the thing that everyone should do to kind of get, get a good picture of, of their impacts on environmental justice populations. So those core elements essentially consist of examining asset management safety and transit access data, 
uh, and how they relate to concentrations of low income and minority populations. We then look at our, uh, that kind of establishes our, our existing conditions uh, in that regard. We then look at our transportation programs, uh, the, the, the TIP and the TYP, as well as everything in our, our RTP project pipeline needs. Uh, kind of, so, which kind of gets to how we are addressing any of the issues that are identified in those existing conditions. Um, so this analysis, the, the, the environmental justice analysis, while uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with, with, with the conclusions and the level of detail that we, that we got with it, um, it is only kind of a snapshot captured at this point in time. It's an it is absolutely an ongoing effort. Actually, this week I have is sitting in on a on a statewide work group meeting where we're all kind of of looking at how we can best use the the methods uh, put forth in that Rutgers study, uh, what what works best uh, at what scale MPO and, and kind of keep developing these these strategies and analyses. And I just wanted to bring it to uh, every, anyone who's viewing this their attention. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the project pipeline. Um, this is kind of the most, I mentioned it before, the most important implementation uh, mechanism of the plan, and it's where municipal involvement is absolutely necessary. Uh, what you see here is the transportation need form. Um, if, if you're listening to this and you're a municipal official, I hope this looks familiar to you. If not, it is available all throughout our website, both the Tri-County website and our, and our HATS Regional Transportation Plan website. Um, it essentially ask questions about you and the, the person filling it out and the need you're seeking to I can kind of identify for evaluation uh, and, and looks to get the most information about it as possible. So anything from who you represent, what kind of need you see there, um, any general thoughts on, solu on, on a proposed solution, um, whether alternatives or costs and now our cost estimates have been developed. And then at the bottom, just to ensure that we, you know, we are kind of talking about the same locations here, we actually ask you to, to map. You click here and you can actually draw a map that then that, that data comes to us linked to your needs form. And we're able to make sure that, that we have the most accurate picture possible. Um, so what happens after somebody submits one of these? Uh, the, the next step for us is that we need to gauge the level of support from the municipality or other potential sponsor. So if a municipal official submits this, um, we here at the very bottom ask them that, you know, there's traditionally a, some kind of financial local match required. So, for us to move a project forward, we need the project sponsor to kind of acknowledge and, and indicate support for that financial match. It can kind of de vary depending on the program or the project itself, but typically it's, it's up to 20% of the project costs. Um, so if that need is identified moving forward and, and, and kind of supported by the municipality, we then move into our it then moves into our project pipeline for evaluation. Um, so at the beginning of this RTP update process, uh, we have a HATS work group that participated in an exercise that we essentially took these 10 categories. Uh, I think it'll be easiest if we look at here. So these 10 categories that are listed here are our scoring categories for the project pipeline. We asked our work group to essentially take 100 points and distribute those 100 points based on what they think is most important. We analyzed all the results, kind of came up with a consensus scoring scheme, uh, and then presented it to both of our committees to kind of 
get support to move forward. Um, and that scoring system or scheme is, is shown here, which is, it, this is that accessible through the project pipeline chapter of the RTP. Click here, brings up this PDF. This PDF will show you both the kind of distribution of points. So you can see safety is, safety came out as the most important aspect kind of, of, of transportation need. Uh, followed by asset management and congestion, and then non-motorized transit, land use, and, and then kind of followed up by freight, mobility, accessibility, resiliency, uh, and environmental justice. So um, not only does that show you the overall points kind of structure, but it shows you within each category how things are scored. So basically all of the mapping throughout the RTP relates then to this PDF. So when we get a when we get a, a transportation need, if it's on a high priority corridor, it gets 15 safety points. Essentially, it can get up to 20 safety points. So if it's on a high priority corridor and there was a bike head crash there, it's going to get the maximum amount of safety points. So you can kind of go down through here uh, and see how things score um, under under each category. Uh, so kind of concurrently, as we were developing that scoring system, we were also doing significant uh, outreach to municipalities and stakeholders in an effort to uh, compile the most comprehensive list possible of transportation needs uh, that we could then run through this evaluation system. Uh, so we had uh, 40, so I, we had a, very many meetings with municipalities uh, across all three counties of our region and, and ended up with a list of somewhere, I think it's 77 transportation needs that, that were identified by municipalities or other eligible project sponsors that they would like to move forward in the, in the process. So, so, each of those transportation needs was then mapped and evaluated across that scoring criteria, that, that, that evaluation criteria I showed in that PDF. That's what is then reflected in this mapping. Um, so the scores for the needs, a little easier to explain here. So you can see, so for this need that was identified, we have the title, uh, we have how it's scored across all of these categories. So this is how the points kind of laid out for that need. We then took these, these total scores um, at the bottom here, see total points. We took the total scores for all of the needs and did some statistical analyses and, and kind of set thresholds for what constitutes a high, medium, and low priority. That's really what you see uh, indicated in these colors. So green is a high priority, yellow is a medium priority, red is a low priority. Um, all of this was then reviewed by all of our HATS committees uh, and kind of agreed upon that it was a sound uh, um, reflection of our, of our region's needs and, and a good product of our work. Uh, so then these priorities are, are used then kind of in multiple ways. Um, in the plan, they're used primarily to establish our fiscally constrained list of projects and needs, uh, which is a requirement of the plan and, and to the federal regulations uh, that, that kind of guide a lot of a lot of the regional transportation plan. Uh, but then they'll also be used when we start doing tip development and start identifying uh, things that we would like to see added. Um, to that transportation improvement program. And, and that's really how things go from transportation need to transportation project and enter that PennDOT uh, project development process. So I think that that's kind of it related to the kind of meat of the regional transportation plan. 
um, I don't know if I said this at, at kind of at the top. We are we are in the middle of our project of our public comment period here. Uh, it began on July first. It ends on October or on August thirty first. Um, we also, as part of that public review process, we have our public participation plan. You can access that here through the through the story map. You can also access that here through the 2045 RTP kind of landing page. Um, Lauren, do you, Lauren Weaver, planner here, um, perform most of the updates on, on that. Do you have anything to? Yeah, basically, um, there wasn't too many new updates. We just added um, a few more um, outreach efforts um, in the virtual terms. So um, like what we're doing tonight with the Zoom meetings, um, having a little bit more outreach there, and then as well as the um, regional growth management plan, um, adding some details into that. So that's about it for the update. Great. Uh, and then also kind of related to the RTP and the and the transportation improvement program, uh, we have our air quality conformity requirements. You can view the AQ report here. You can also get to it, like I said earlier, through the landing page. The air quality conformity report is a very technical document that essentially affirms that our that the projects and needs identified in our plans both the tip and the rtp are consistent with the federal air quality regulations and they are so um that, that that's kind of a, a technical a, a very technical document and a requirement that needs to be included so that's also provided for for review and comment um i Um, so, uh, if anybody, uh, we have one participant, I think Julie's on the, on the line. Um, if she has any questions, we have plenty of time to address it. Uh, and if anybody's listening to this kind of after, uh, this evening and has any questions, um, or comments, official comments need to be submitted to Lauren Weaver. Um, at the email address here. This information is also available uh, on that landing page. Um, this will get, uh, if you submit a comment through through Lauren, that, that's what constitutes kind of an official public comment on the plan and will it'll get an official response from us and be included in the, in the appendix uh, of the plan itself. If you have just a general question or comment about something, uh, I'd encourage you to reach out to any of us. Again, my name is Andrew Bomberger, Lauren Weaver, Kyle Snyder uh, was also um, the, the, the gentleman that discussed safety and congestion. Um, Steve Deck, who was unable to join us this evening, is our executive director. Uh, kind of getting in touch with any of us will, will help. Uh, if if your question or concern is able to be answered, that that's kind of the the way to go about it. So um, if there's no questions from from the gallery, I think uh, we'll wrap up for tonight. Is there a question? I don't have any questions now. I okay. I do, but I I think I'll I'll, I'll wait and talk to one of you. Um, you know, I, another time. Okay, well here, how about, I mean, we can, I'll stop the recording now and we can just talk right now. I'm assuming it's related to the, to the chat question you had. Correct. There okay. were, yeah, there was um, about seven years ago or so, uh, a couple of supervisors and myself met with PennDOT and the, the bike advocacy. And there was three plans that were, conceptual plans from the uh, railroad bridge um, down to the Fort Hunter 
uh, the exit to get off there at Fort Hunter, Front Street. And um, we, it's just kind of a twofold type of um, plan that we, we, were, we were contemplating of the, 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 like a walkway along that area of uh, the Narrows. It's probably less than a mile. But anyways, I, I just, I wasn't sure how to, where to take that, uh, where it's at, or um, we have a meeting with Sue Helm and Senator DeSantos in two weeks to discuss this. Um, so I guess what, what would your recommendation be to include try to get that included on the 2045 plan. So Julie, if, if you look at, I scroll down, you're included here in the uh, illustrative section of the plan. So it is included. It is, uh, it was not included in the, in the fiscal constraint analysis. Um, as you can see, everything here because of our, our funding constraints, and this gets very, I, I did the fiscal constraint analysis and it gets, it gets, oh, are you able to see this, Julie? I'm not. Oh, I stopped sharing, I'm sorry. <laughs> That'd make it difficult. Okay. Can you see this now where, I, where I'm highlighting on this table? Yes. So you're included as a, as a study recommendation under the illustrative project list. So um, due to our fiscal constraints, mm -hmm. we, ha we had to, uh, you know, all of these are projects or needs that were uh, submitted and identified that are, have to be listed, listed as illustrative because that indicates that we do not have the financial resources to complete them. Um, as you can see, we have quite a lot of right. illustrative needs. So, uh, and we talked on the phone about this. I'm not sure there is a kind of a singular solution to this. I think the solution is going to be that we try to identify multiple avenues of funding um, and, and need to coordinate those. Now that obviously <laughs> makes this a lot more difficult. Um, but I, you know, I think this is a, a product of, of the, the, the need to balance all of our priorities with, with the limited funds available. Right. Now that I understand. I, since it's, you just showed it's on here. That's, um, that's, at least that's a plus. So, yeah. um, it, and I'll be joining you for that meeting as far okay, as I good. know. Okay. Um, and honestly, you do it. This is how that gets done. You know, you start pushing and getting, getting uh, um, elected officials involved and, and kind of generating support from multiple angles, I think is how this eventually, uh, you know, comes to be. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I think it would be a, a fantastic project to kind of to to finally like connect. <laughs> Seems like we were kind of sit by ourselves and finally come to connect us to Harrisburg well, and Dolphin Borough too. We, we kind of see ourselves almost at one anymore. But um, and then the upper, you know, the upper Dolphin area too. That sure uh, that may, may want to well, come I down. Know, I know. Yeah, I, I know that we've we've looked at even you know can, making that connection from Fort Hunter up to Detweiler Park is a uh, is certainly a plus and a thing that can start to generate you know at, at use and, and and traffic along there and I you know I look at the we do bike and pedestrian counts um, mm -hmm. twice a year and the Fort Hunter extension. Um, when Carl Dixon was was pushing for that, he would he we do it like I said twice a year. We we have kind of rounds of counting, and mm -hmm. we do each one five times. Carl counted it. I think he did it every single time he could. So we have 
very comprehensive counts for for that location and it mm -hmm. went from like one or two people in the entire two hours that he would count every time to now it's up to like 40 or 50 so oh yeah it's pretty busy yeah yeah it, it, it's especially in areas like that without it without a dedicated facility you're just not going to get it but if you mm -hmm. have that dedicated facility you know, it, it, it's very much a build it and they will come kind of proposition. So, yes. And I see all ages out riding bike and yep. walking, which is great. Um, well, okay. Well, yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll make sure I, I, I just got back from vacation on Monday. I know that email was in there. I think I put it on my calendar. Uh, I'll make sure it's on there, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll be joining you, um, for that meeting. Okay, perfect. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks for attending. Yep. <laughs> and yep. if you need, if you have any other questions, we <laughs> we have time and room for them. Okay. Um, no, I'm I'm good. This was a I uh, learned a lot tonight. Even I did participate the one in July, and but this I really learned a lot this evening. And um, at first, I think in July I was very confused on navigating through when I was out on my computer or my laptop, but I went out again yesterday and it was much easier the, um, to find information I was looking for. So, okay. Yeah. It's well, I mean, that's good I, to hear. Yeah. Unfortunately in our area that darn underpass, the railroad <laughs> under that's a underpass. It's just a pinch area and, um, not much to do there, but yep. Um, other than uh, no widening or anything like that, so just yeah. something we can we can hopefully work with. Well, th thanks for kind of the attention and the and the stick to itiveness. Yeah. Oh well, thank you, thank you, and uh, I appreciate everybody help. You know, when I have questions, you you everybody's always quick to answer, and you never make me feel like I'm asking too many or i'm not understanding I mean, you you uh you, you're very patient so thank you for that thank you and i i guess there's probably no other questions so yep. um unless kyle if you have a question um i, I, I think <laughs> i think we'll wrap it up so thanks everyone for attending thank you